Good morning and welcome to Storytime. Thank you so much for joining in today. I hope you're well. Thank you for being here. I hope we had sound on there, technical difficulties on this end, but so glad you're here. Thank you so much for being here and welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you. And yes, we have special guests coming to join us today. Joy Yamaguchi and Nina Nakao will be here today. So please do stick around and join in for that because they're bringing in some great information and of course learning for each one of us out there. Thank you so much for being here. And today we are reading the bracelet. Yes, the bracelet. So I hope you're ready for this one. I am excited to share it and uh, great lessons for us. And we're reading this one with permission of Philomeo Books, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Thank you so much for joining in. Good morning. As always, please let me know where you're joining us from and who is joining in with you. Welcome to Storytime. Thank you for being here. I hope you and your loved ones are doing well today. Thank you so much. Good morning to you. Let us see who is with us getting ready for that story abraham i don't know if you're actually here today i saw this yesterday good morning to you how are you doing i hope you're here good morning to you and of course good morning to you terry as well thank you so much for joining us today good morning to you amanda how are you doing today and baby bia how are you doing out in sunny seattle thank you so much for being here today good morning to you i hope you're ready for a wonderful story that awaits us today Great learning indeed. Good morning to you, Jen Vetta. How are you doing today? I'm glad you're here. Good morning and hopefully see you at school later on today. Thank you for joining in, Jen Vetta. Good morning to you. <laughs> Good morning to you, Sarah and Nathan out in Illinois. How are you doing today? And of course, Amanda West, how are you doing? Thank you for joining in today on Storytime. I hope you're ready. We have our guest today, of course, uh, Joy Yamaguchi will be joining us later on. And of course, Nina Nakao, and they will be talking about a lot of things. And so I'm excited for that. And I hope you are too. Great learning together. Great conversation awaits. Thank you so much for joining in. And I hope you're ready for our story today. The bracelet. And this one is, um, is we're reading with permission of Philomeo Books, uh, an imprint of Penguin Random House. And I just had to check for one thing there. Absolutely wonderful to have this book with us today. Thank you for being here. Good morning to you. And uh, Kerry and Lomani Lee, how are you doing today? Joining us from Sacramento. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. I am glad you're here. Everybody, please get comfortable. Get ready. We have a story ahead of us, a good story, uh, 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 one that has a lot of teaching for us for sure and lots of reflection that will be happening. And then, of course, uh, we'll have our guests come Coming through to share more information with us. Thank you for joining us. Lomani Lee and Kerry out in Sacramento. Good morning to you. <laughs> Good morning to you, Isabella, Luis, and Leslie, right here in Oakland. Good to see you. I hope your summer is going well. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, yes, congratulations, Luis. I hope you're ready for is it high school now. Thank you so much for joining in and uh, wishing you the very best when we start are back in the fall. Ellen Edwards, good morning to you out in sunny Chicago. Thank you for joining in. I hope, Ellen, our connection today is better for you. Thank you so much for joining in. And um, yes, I hope there are no glitches or anything like that today. Good to see you as always, Ellen. Thank you for being here. And I am glad you're here with us and excited for our story that awaits. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, we'll be getting started with our story. And so our guests will be here too after the reading. I'm excited for that. And um, yeah, we have Joy Yamaguchi and Nina Nakao here with us. So they'll be here joining us right after the story. Are you ready for this one? The bracelet. And um, yes, reading this one with permission of uh, Philomeo Books, an imprint of uh, Penguin Random House. And for those of you that have been to Oakland or the Bay Area, those houses should look familiar indeed. Yes, that's it. It's every time we open this page, and I've been talking about it too, it's like every time you open that page, it's like, whoa, yeah, those are, those are definitely Bay Area houses, right? <laughs> All right. Says so uh, the author and publisher gratefully acknowledge the help of Dr. 
Donald Durban in making this book possible. The illustrator gratefully acknowledges the Uno family of Northampton for opening their home and library to her and the Amherst Japanese Language School for helping her with our story. All right. Emmy didn't want her big sister to see her cry. She wiped the tears away quickly, but couldn't wipe away the sadness inside. It's almost time to go, her mother called, and Emmy knew they would have to leave their home soon. She looked around her, she looked around her room. It was as empty now as the rest of the house, like a gift box with no gift inside, filled with a lot of nothing. Emmy closed her eyes and tried to remember how it looked, how it had looked. Flowered chintz curtains at the window, her clothes scattered everywhere, her favorite rag doll and teddy bear sitting on the chest. She could even remember how the whole house looked if she closed her eyes and kept pictures of it inside her head. Emmy and her family weren't moving because they wanted to. The government was sending them to prison camp because they were Japanese Americans and America was at war with Japan. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were being treated like the enemy just because they looked like the enemy. The FBI had sent Papa to a prisoner of war camp in Montana just because he worked for a Japanese company. It was crazy, Emmy thought. They, they loved America, but America didn't love them back and it didn't want to trust them. Emmy ran to the door when she heard the doorbell. Maybe, she thought, a messenger from the government would be standing there, tall and proper and buttoned into a uniform. Maybe he would tell them it was a mistake that they didn't have to go to camp after all. But when Emmy opened the door, it wasn't a messenger at all. It was her best friend, Laurie Madison, who was in the second grade with her. She hadn't come to walk to school with Emmy, and she hadn't come to ask her to go roller skating. She hadn't come to show her a new dress or ask her to go to the store with her either. She came with a gift, as though she had come for a birthday party. But she wasn't wearing her good party dress, and she looked just as sad as Emmy. Just as sad as Emmy felt. Here, she said, thrusting her gift at Emmy. It's a bracelet. It's for you to take to camp. Laurie helped Emmy put, the bracelet, put on the bracelet. It was a thin gold chain with a heart dangling on it, and Emmy loved it the minute she saw it. I will never, ever take it off, Emmy promised, not even when I take a shower. Laurie gave Emmy a hug. Well, goodbye then, she said. Come back soon. I will, Emmy answered, but she really didn't know if she would ever come back to Berkeley. Maybe she would never see Laurie again. She watched as Laurie walked down the block, turning and waving and walking backwards until she got to the corner. Emmy couldn't bear to watch anymore, and she slammed the door shut. When the doorbell rang, it was their neighbor, Mrs. Simpson. She had come to take them to the center where all the Japanese Americans were to report. Come on, Emmy, get your things, her sister, her sister Eiko called. It's time to go. Emmy made sure her gold bracelet was secure on her wrist. Then she put on both her sweater and her coat so she wouldn't have to carry them. They could take only what they could carry and her two suitcases were already full. Each family had a number, had a number now, and Emmy put tags with their number, 13453, on her two suitcases. Mama took a last look around the house, going from room to room. Emmy followed her, trying to remember how each one had looked when they were filled with furniture and rugs and pictures and books. They went out for a last look at the garden Papa loved. If he were here now, Emmy knew he would pick one of the prettiest carnations and bring it inside. This is for you, Mama, he would say. And Mama would smile and put, 
put it in the best crystal vase. But now the garden looked shabby and bare. Papa was gone and mama was too busy to care for it. It looked the way Emmy felt, lonely and abandoned. When they got to the center, Emmy saw hundreds of Japanese Americans everywhere. Grandmas and grandpas, mothers and fathers and children and babies. Everyone was clutching bandos and suitcases tagged with family numbers. Some people were crying, but most just quiet, just sat quietly. Emmy's stomach was jumping up and down and she wondered if everybody was as scared as she was. She touched a small gold heart on her bracelet and tried to feel brave. When she saw soldiers carrying guns with bayonets standing at every doorway, she was so scared her knees began to wobble. Will they shoot if anyone tries to run away? She asked her sister. But Reiko just shrugged. I don't know, she said solemnly. Maybe. Mm. Soon it was time for everyone to board buses lined up at the curb. They would take them to Tumpf Ten foreign racetracks, which the army had turned into prison camps. At the bus, as the bus started down the streets, she knew so well. As the bus started the streets down the streets, she knew so well. Emmy kept her eyes on the window. They passed the cattle grocery store where Mama used to buy bean curds, cakes, bean curd cakes, and pickled radishes. The windows were boarded up now. But Emmy saw a sign still hanging on the door. It said, we are loyal Americans. I am too, Emmy thought. We all are. But the army didn't seem to think so. The bus sped down the water's edge and crossed the Bay Bridge, looking silvery in the sun. Goodbye, bridge, Emmy whispered. Goodbye, San Francisco. Goodbye, seagulls. Amy glanced at her sister sitting at her sister sitting next to her and could tell she was trying hard not to cry. Stupid army, Reiko was muttering. Stupid war. And then they were at the Tanforan racetracks. There was a barbed wire fence around it and guard towers at each corner. Armed guards swung open the gates to let the buses in and then closed them so no one could get out. They were locked in. They were assigned to barrack 16, apartment number 40, and Papa's friend, Mr. Noma, helped them look for it. It wasn't among the mass of army barracks built around the racetrack or in the infield. In fact, it wasn't a barrack at all. It was a long stable where the horses had lived, and each store had a number on it. Well, here it is, Mr. Noma said as he came to the store marked number 40. This is your apartment. Emmy and Reiko peered inside. Gosh, mama, it's filthy. No matter what, no matter what anybody called it, it wasn't just dark, dirty hostel that still smelled of, it was just a dark, dirty hostel that still smelled of horses. And the linoleum laid over the dirt was littered with wood shavings, nails, dust, and dead bugs. There was nothing the store in the store except three folded army cots lying on the floor. Mama tried to cheer them up. I will have Mrs. Simpson send us materials for curtains, she said. It will look better when we fix it. But Emmy could tell Mama felt just as bad as she did, and no one could think of anything more to say. Mr. Norma went to get mattresses for them. I'd better hurry before they're all gone, he said. He rushed off because he didn't want to see Emmy's mother cry. But she didn't cry. She just went out to borrow a broom and swept out the dust and dirt and bugs. It was just after Emmy and Reiko had set up the army cots that she noticed. My bracelet's gone, Emmy screamed. I've lost my bracelet. Emmy looked in every corner of their store and along the ramp that had led to their stable. Mama and Reiko helped her, but no one could find it. It was getting dark, but Mama got out her flashlight and they walked back along the racetrack, retracing every step they had taken. The track was muddy and full of puddles, 
from the rain, from the rain the day before. They looked and looked, but they couldn't find Emmy's bracelet anywhere. It was now, it was time now to have supper at the grandstand. Emmy stood with her mama and Reiko at the end of a long weaving line, each of them clutching a plate and fork. But all she could think of was her bracelet. Already she had lost the one thing that would help her remember her best friend. Emmy wanted to cry. The next day, as Emmy unpacked her suitcase, she found her favorite red sweater. She remembered how she and Laurie had both worn their red sweaters on the first day of school. They had had matching lunch boxes too. And after school, they had gone to fly kites in the vacant lot near home. Emmy could just see their red and yellow kites dancing in the wind. And suddenly, Emmy knew she was remembering Laurie that very minute, right inside her head just the way she could remember every room in the house in Berkeley. Maybe she thought she didn't really need the bracelet to remember Laurie after all. Mr. Norma came to put, on, to put up some shelves for them. He had even made them a table and bench from scrap lumber. The first thing mama put on the shelf was a photo of Papa, but Amy knew she didn't need a photo of Papa to remember him. It was as though Mama had the same thought. You know, Amy, she said, you don't need a bracelet to remember Laurie any more than we need a photo to remember Papa or our home, all our friends and things we loved and have left behind. Those are things we carry in our hearts and take with us no matter where we are, no matter where we are sent. Amy knew Mama was right. They would soon be sent to a camp in the Utah desert, but Laurie would still be in the heart, in their heart, even there. Laurie would always be her friend, no matter where she was sent. And Amy knew she would never forget Laurie, ever. The end. And um, there is an afterward too that we'll uh, get to at some point, but right now I just wanted to, um, just take a minute, everybody that's joining in right now, just take a minute and, um, you know, hopefully we can appreciate the gravity of, of what happened. And um, just reading this book, you know, gives you an insight into what people were leaving behind, what they were forced to leave behind. And, um, and knowing that they were being stripped away from friends, family, relatives, and things that they knew. And I, as an immigrant, somebody who's moved from my home by choice, I still miss it. But there's always that feeling that I know I can get back. But it was just, uh, for me, it was really um, a learning experience right now and just a realization of thinking how final that might have felt, not knowing what was going to happen. And um, I just want us to appreciate that. And also, um, as I bring on the guests, I want us to really open our minds and think how, um, how as people, we can be better and uh, we can continue to strive to be better. Uh, we will not always be perfect, but we can do things that can be um, that can help our communities. And um, I know, I hope we can, by the end of this, we will have a, a bit of smiles on our faces. But this is a big topic. And I am glad today to introduce to you my guests who are coming on and bringing us a wealth of information and, of course, a wealth of experience as well. And please welcome me in, um, on Storytime today. Welcome me in, Joy, uh, uh, welcome Joy Yamaguchi. And uh, of course, Nina Nakao as well. Please welcome to Storytime. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Now this is, oh my goodness, so much. Um, every time I've read that book, it just, the impact is there. I just feel it every time heavier and heavier and um, Welcome to you too. Please just um, tell us a bit about yourselves and then uh, of course what you have for us. And um, I'm excited to hear what you have. <laughs> Maybe let's start with you, okay. Nina. Oh, okay, yeah. So thank you so much for having us. We're both coming to you today kind of in a dual capacity, right? We're both Japanese Americans <laughs> um, and we 
also both have like studied and worked in the Japanese American community. And right now we both work at a, a museum in Los Angeles in a neighborhood called Little Tokyo called the Japanese American National Museum. And at that museum, we tell stories like this story uh, to visitors of all ages about the, th the immigrants who came from Japan, mm -hmm. what happened to them during World War II, and what's happened to the community since then, what the community looks like today. So um, for me personally, I'm a fourth generation biracial Japanese American. My great, great grandparents, my great grandparents came to Hawaii um, to look for work in the sugar plantations there. And they farmed and they raised all of their families in Hawaii and on the island of Oahu and Hilo. Um, and today, and because of that, they weren't incarcerated during World War II. The experience of Japanese Americans in Hawaii was a little bit different. Um, but today I work at Janum in the education department and I help teach this history to kids of all ages. Um, and I'm very much part of the community, even without having gone through this yeah. incarceration one story. One time, what, is, what is Janum? Yeah, Janum, the Japanese American National Museum. Thank kind you. of funny acronym, absolutely. Joy, do you wanna share? Yeah, hi, um, my name is Joy. Uh, I also, I work with Nina at Janum, like she mentioned, um, and there I get to do public programming, so events and things kind of like story time. <laughs> um, but I am also a Japanese American. Um, I am fourth generation or Yonse, um, and on my dad's side, um, I'm also biracial. Um, and I, have you know this book is really really connects with me oh hi max <laughs> and hi everyone who's here um yeah because my family was incarcerated during world war ii um and it's really important part of our family history um like um emmy in the story and emmy's actually also my middle name so <laughs> extra special um but my family was taken um, from their homes and sent to um, three different camps, the two of them. So my um, grandfather, my old Chan, was from Salinas, California and went to um, uh, Gila River um, in Arizona. Um, and then my Obachan or my grandma was um, from the Los Angeles area and then taken to similar to Emmy in the story, the Santa Anita racetrack. So um, here in Los Angeles and then taken to Rower and Jerome in Arkansas. So um, this is a family story and uh, a history that is, you know, it's hard to talk about. It's a, um, I still, even though like Nina said, I spend so much time talking about this in my work and my personal life and my organizing, um, I still, I still get emotional, you know, when I hear these stories, it still um, really hits close to home. And I, and I think that I saw some comments thinking, talking about how powerful it is here from a children's perspective. And I think that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, is, and, yeah. oh, just, here, yeah. Do you want, mm -hmm. if you want to read, I, I can share some pictures if you want to. Oh, okay. Yes. Manage. No, just, uh, I, I just thought that from Amanda was, uh, as you're saying, we have discussed this part of the history together as a family, but hearing mm -hmm. a story from a child's point of view and making it something children can relate to, you know, judging by the kids is uh, my kids, her kids, they're intently listening is mm -hmm. doing a better job of reaching them and the discussion I could ever have. And that's, you know, like, um, that's such a powerful uh, message there, Amanda. And uh, this is one of the things I think that we were talking about too is, you know, and I was thinking about like, how do we equip parents out there? How do we equip educators? How do we equip, you know, the community at large to bring, you know, like um, to tackle these topics and to tackle these issues. And uh, I, I have I have that question, but I also know that you have a presentation that you have ready. So I'll let you go into that and then we can uh, we can look back and, and answer some of those questions, but absolutely appreciate you both. That's a really good question right? Thinking about how we talk to kids about difficult topics. And there are so many things that children have to face uh, and, you know, get first or second hand from their parents. And this is such a good story of that. And when you were reading it just now, like a line jumped out to me that I'd never noticed before, but thinking mm. about how Emmy notices that her mom doesn't cry. She just starts sweeping. She starts cleaning mm. the mm. barrack. Mm. And I think that that's a very kind of common narrative when we talk to people who are survivors of this history today, they're mostly in 
octogenarians in their 80s or 90s. Um, and so they were kids when this happened um, and they have lots of happy memories of, of what camp was like. But as a kid, you do understand as well, your family's going through this monumental change. Right. Your parents are struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter how much of like a, a positive face the parent is putting forward, mm -hmm. um, you know, you pick up on that. And so, right. yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, and, and, you know, like, as you're mentioning that book too, another one that I'm just thinking of was, I know this book was written, I think, is it 96? So, and Joey had mentioned this as well. So, you know, like, and, and I know you'll be touching on this, but what is it, what are some of the things that maybe stand out that you think, oh, maybe this time I would want to address this in a, in this way, or are there things like that, that stand out from that book for you? So, and please tell me when to just, I'll let you do your, <laughs> we don't have a presentation just have some pictures that we can share <laughs> um <Awesome>. but <laughs> Mina, did you want to start off or do you want me to you start off about okay yeah we we kind of got together and we thought of some, some <laughs> things that jump out to us as things that are the most important parts of this story from our point of view and maybe in current circumstances in our today right yeah. So I yeah. can yeah, I can start by oh, it's not letting me share my screen. Um no. but I don't know if uh Mr. Lamada you can share from the file that I Oh, sent okay. You, but if oh. not if not, not totally fine. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> um okay. but I can figure it out while Nina's talking later. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think that something that really struck me about kind of the initial part of this um the story is that first line um, was when they say they weren't moving because they wanted to. A fun story, because <laughs> not a fun story, but from, from my family um, is that um, when I was in third grade, I remember that my um, I was supposed to do a report on someone I knew that moved. <laughs> and my dad was like, you should talk to your grandma, your bachan. And um, I remember talking to her about it and I was like, so like, why did you move to Arkansas? And she's like, well, we didn't have a, didn't have the choice. Um, we didn't have a chance. So um, you, um, it feels um, really, like I said before, really personally impactful. And then I think that something else that we wanted to talk about a lot was this kind of idea of being taken away from your family and being um, separated. And I, and I know that's a, it's a really scary, really scary thought. Um, to imagine. And um, Emmy's father in the beginning of the story is taken by the FBI and sent to, um, she calls a prisoner of war camp in Montana. Um, and this happened to a lot of Japanese men, especially those who were not U.S. citizens, though some also who were um, after um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor because they were seen as a threat, um, despite whether or not they actually, you know, had any there was any real reason to um, believe that, but a lot of them, because they they were culturally involved, they were involved with their community, they were involved with teaching Japanese or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a really hard time. And and like Emmy's mom became essentially a single mother in that time um, who had to keep the family together through the camp and take care of everything. So like mm -hmm. Nina said, immediately springing into action, um, prioritizing family first. So there are some um, connections, I think, to the work we do at the museum, but also connections to the present day and um, mm -hmm. ideas of families being kept together and struggling and immigration in the present day. Um, Nina, I don't know if you want to share any about the yeah. um, have, As you're sharing, let me just, uh, so I have this and you can tell me, if. Can you go to the one right below this one? Right below it. Okay. Uh, is it this one? Yes. All right. And I don't know if Joy, you wanted to touch on the pictures that you had at the top. I can. So this is a photograph that speaks so close, clearly to what Joy is talking about. Right. This idea of a family kind of fighting to maintain normalcy. Um, and it's a family photograph, like many photos in our collection at the museum that shows a happy family. They're smiling, they're playing in the snow. Um, but this is a family uh, from a collection called the Yamashita Family Collection, um, where the father, like Emmy's father in the story, was taken away from his family um, by the FBI. And so it follows the family as they move from their homes to a concentration camp 
and, and the father as he moves around from these different prisoner of war camps. Um, and so we've put the link as well at the top. It's one of Genem's educational microsites that's designed mm. for kids to uh, kind of explore this history on their own terms. And um, so it's called Enemy Mail, and that's a really good resource that I would recommend for, for probably about third or fourth grade and up, but anybody can look at it. Um, I'm going to go on to the next thing, Joel. <laughs> Okay. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, ahead? and I, I can I can just say that um, with that I think there's a lot of um, uh, current um, struggles and and talking about um, this. So groups like Sudri for Solidarity, which has some resources for kids that I can share, um, are talking about connecting the past and the present, and I think that's really helpful. And I'm sure that a lot of the people that are watching have their own, um, you know stories of their families and their connections to immigration and mm -hmm. to incarceration. And so um, I think that that's really been really helpful to me is thinking about my own family story and how does that connect with other people's narratives and other mm -hmm. people's struggles. Yeah, yeah. I definitely yeah. agree. So the oh, other and I guess, thing, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is a picture of my grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we share a birthday. We all have birthdays in November, which is why we're wearing party hats recently. But as Nina said, like they're older now, right? And and we've recorded some of their stories, but not all of them. And then this is us many years back. And you may recognize Lydia Yamaguchi from Storytime with Mr. Lamada there in that picture on the right um, with a lay on her head. Um, <laughs> Lydia is my sibling. Um, <laughs> and then that's our grandparents as well. And then the next picture down is um, their their parents. So those are our great grandparents. And actually I hadn't realized that we had pictures of them in camp, um, but that one's labeled as Kiono Yoshida, which is my great grandmother um, and their, and then my great grandfather, Joichi. Um, so you can see the barrack in the background. And um, yeah, I just wanted to show this because, you know, it's family, but also the their ages. Um, and just kind of connecting through time. Yeah, Nina, I don't know if you wanted yeah, to. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> can we go down to the sixth slide, please? All right. Excellent. So I think that this really ties in as well with what Joy talks about with her family, this idea of moving somewhere because you don't want to. And it's also something that we really wanted to make sure we touched upon because um, in thinking about best practices of teaching about difficult history, in any scenario, but especially in this in this history, um, it's really important the language that we use to talk about those things, right? Mm -hmm. So Joy talks about her family moving, not because they wanted to, but because they had to, right? We're not talking about an immigration. And there's lots of stories of immigrants and Japanese immigrants and their families. But in this case, and the bracelet, right, we're thinking about a forced removal, um, a family going somewhere because they're being told they have to by their government, right? In the story, Emmy and Reiko, they see guards with guns. And that's a very common narrative for, for little kids who who left, whose, whose families had to leave neighborhoods like their family home in Berkeley and be escorted by military men with, with, with guns. Um, so because of that, we use all these specific words, right? We used force removal, not a, like a, a relocation. Sometimes when we learn about this history, we hear the term evacuation, but I know a lot of Mr. Lamada's audience is from California and all across the country, right? We know when evacuation happens, that's something that's a threat to your family's safety, right? Maybe there's a mudslide or a fire or an earthquake. In this case, this evacuation is not for their own safety, but because of years and decades and decades of racism, of this fear because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and all these military reasons. And because the, the government, the leaders allow this kind of breakdown in, in people's civil rights at this time. So this is a, a historic photo of the forced removal of people in the Los Angeles, little Tokyo neighborhood. And that's where our museum also stands today. And then we see on the other side, like in 2021, this photo, it's in the same spot from a different angle. Um, of the Japanese Americans standing in solidarity with other communities coming together to, to speak out, right? We use this history today. We learn stories like the bracelet because it helps us understand what happened in the past and how we can kind of learn from it in the future. Um, 
And so part of that is always going to be language. So we use words. We generally don't use the word internment camp. Um, at the time that this book was written, it was a lot more common to use that word. But when we look at the definition for the word internment camp, it's not super accurate. So 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans were placed in these camps um, all across the inland of the United States. And two thirds of those people were US citizens. So at our museum and in my learning and teaching, I use the word concentration camp because by definition, that's a place where people are held, not because of a crime that they committed, but because of who they are. So right in this case, because they were Japanese American, because of their ancestry and their heritage. And clearly in the book, right, Emmy's thinking about this. She's thinking about how she feels like an American. She feels loyal, but she doesn't feel loved by her country. And I think that that is very clear. Um, it is very clear as we think about this. And using the word concentration camp is also not to say it was anything like what happened in Nazi Germany when we learn about those concentration camps, but to think about um, the specific definition and how not even calling Nazi Germany's camps concentration camps is a bit of a euphemism covering up something a lot sadder that was actually happening, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. So um, we also love the imagery in this book of this bracelet that she holds on to this bracelet and the bracelet is so important to her. Um, and, you know, we like to collect things at our museum. We like to have items and stuff and it's, really very true that her mom says you don't need the bracelet to remember your friend Lori and she'll always remember her friend Lori but at the same time things often do hold a lot of meaning for us the family photos that we see from Joy's family's collection are so important um to her and her family right and same for lots of things in my family but um we have lots of things like that at the museum that hold stories and so I wanted to share one of those with you that I think is really special on the next slide, we can see a, like a brooch, a pin that was made in camp, in actually the camp that Emmy's family is being sent to in Topaz, Utah, which is a desert. Um, and if we look really closely at that pin, think about, make a guess to yourself, what do you think that the petals are made out of? What do you think? So if you look really closely, you'll notice that they're actually made out of seashells. So. A long, long, long time ago, Topaz, Utah might have been under the water. It might have been a ri riverbed. And so people, lots of people in the camps spent their time making art about their experience and turning kind of nothing into something, turning an ugly experience into a beautiful one. And so we have these uh, painted seashells that turn into these beautiful flower brooch. And that's um, very important to how we tell the story and how the story is told in the book too. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. It's so just gorgeous and you never think until you look closer. Um, and I put the link in the chat so folks can check out these resources because there's so much really rich stuff that you can um, dive into and have a conversation with your family about. Um, and then just, we also wanted to touch on this idea of like, solidarity and this idea of friendship um you know this this friendship with lori um who comes and, and it's they described as being just as sad as emmy and just has the, they have this this strong friendship and this strong relationship um and and their friendship is you know not defined by their <laughs> difference in ethnicity um but there's so many stories of this friendship and of people kind of taking a stand and and being um, in a time when, like Nina said, there was so much racism and there was so much fear and there was so much hatred because of that fear. Um, it was really powerful when people, um, you know, stood against that and took a stand. Um, so, you know, there were, I don't know if folks are watching, you know, the Quakers, but they were one um, group, uh, religious group that t uh, sponsored a lot of young Japanese Americans to leave camp early and go pursue college careers. Um, there were neighbors who watched over property. A story that my family has is that um, one of the, on my, my Bachan side, they had a Mexican um, farmhand family. Um, we don't know their names, but uh, 
when they were had to leave the farm because they were a farm family before the war um instead of selling all of their um, farming supplies they gave it to that family um and that's just a moment of um solidarity in my family's history and um different marginalized groups standing together um, and then one really powerful story that's also in our collection is Miss Clara Breed. Um, she was a local public librarian, and we know we love librarians here um, in San Diego. And she um, spoke out against this incarceration of her former students. And she gave the students these like books and supplies and ways to write to her. Um, and we have so many of these letters in our collection of students writing to her and telling her about their daily lives, about what happened, about um, uh, just their experiences. And it ranges from being, you know, just really simple, what they did in that day, what they ate, what they um, learned in school to um, some really hard things to read when you think about children being put in these conditions. So um, this friendship was really hopeful to them um, and really, um just uh powerful and we're really grateful to be able to look at that so you can go to our website um and um learn more about that um and if you want to um get involved with your family we're going to be having an event coming up on may 9th where you can write to other um to children and connect each pleasant day that are currently being held um in the pomona fairgrounds um as um, a way of solidarity. These children are migrant children, unaccompanied minors um, that are waiting to be reunited with their families. So um, I'll put a link to that opportunity in the chat as well, but there's lots of ways and I would encourage folks to get connected locally too. I know there's lots of folks in the Bay Area and resources for all ages. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for sharing those <laughs> stories. And as you can see, yeah, just uh, I think Angela too is saying, you know, thank you for sharing your your family stories and i think that language you know like it's so important because for somebody like me who's learning and it, i'm still learning even though, like i came much later to the us and you know you heard about things but you i see so much there's still so much more that i i i'm still learning and i need to learn and so i'm hoping that everybody out there too is getting that information and uh, and feeling a little better equipped after this to in, to talk about these issues but another thing that i wanted to ask you too was um going through school and as you know like as japanese americans and how did you feel the school system dealt with this with this the education around this how do you think how you know how was it was it did it meet a certain standard or what would what would you want to see how would you have wanted it to be done and yeah, anybody can take it out. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that from? Um, I guess, yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you sound good. Okay. So uh, both Joy and I grew up in California. Um, I went to public schools in Berkeley, in Berkeley Unified School District my whole childhood. Um, but I don't have very strong memories of learning about camp. Mm. Uh, incarceration is included in California's um, curriculum standards, um, but it's not included in many other states. So going to college was kind of a rude awakening to the fact that many of my friends um, who grew up across the country didn't have any background for this history, um, or if they did, it was much later and much quicker. And, and I think it, that's a huge shame, right? People should be able to learn about this without having to seek it out themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's it's difficult and lots of teachers kind of shy away maybe from knowing how to talk about it and so maybe choosing not to instead. Uh, at the museum, we teach field trips. We bring students on site when possible um, and t connect with them virtually of all ages. But at the same time, right, it, we always are striving for more access to this education. Mm -hmm. And and one thing you mentioned there, you say, you know, like people shying away for various mm -hmm. reasons. Like you mentioned, you know, maybe not feeling comfortable to talk about it, not not feeling equipped to talk about it. And so, um, you know, what message would you have for the leadership and what what things can happen in school districts? And and I know that this is, you know, like just your thoughts on it. And um, hopefully yeah. somebody <laughs> out there is listening who has, you know. <laughs> But um, yeah, what are some things that you think could be could be done? 
Well, I know that California is working really hard to um, get like an ethnic studies curriculum as part of our history. And so like learning about camps, concentration camps, internment camps as part of California history is great, but it's also part of Asian American history in our state, right? It's part of like this rich, vibrant culture of immigrants and their families and their stories. Um, and I think that that's gonna be a really important step, including it as part of uh, understanding your personhood as a kid, understanding your identity and your family's story and your neighbor's family's story um, is really important to, per, to push mm. for, for ethnic studies. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was, a. I mean, I, I didn't get ethnic studies until I went to college and then I studied it in college and that was really powerful for me. Actually, one of the first classes I took was on mixed race studies and like seeing myself reflected and being able to study things that felt just so relevant to my my own story just felt really affirming. Um, so I do think it's so, like Nina said, so important that just so many more stories that are often not told get reflected in the curriculum. I, I remember learning about it and I think similar to a lot of people, I'd be curious about some of the folks that are watching of all ages, like what they, what they got, but um, it was just, you know, like a chapter or mm -hmm. even like a paragraph in a <laughs> chapter on World War II. Um, but my family was really different than a lot of families in that we talked about it. A lot of families after the mm -hmm. camp, it was just because it was such mm -hmm. a difficult time, they didn't want to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that was shame or just lack of, you know, you just don't want to revisit that time. It's over. They want to put it away. Um, right. But my family did talk about it and just not saying it's that's inherently better, just different. Um, but I think that it was really important because then when these stories get told, we learn from them. Um, yeah. And I think that like Nina said, a lot of times people want to shy away from talking about things that are difficult, things about our country's history, which there are many that aren't, aren't so nice. Um, but when we, um, when we do talk about it, when we are able to engage with difficult things, and I think that a lot of times people don't give credit to young folks for being able to talk about this. Um, yeah. <laughs> we yeah. see like Nina seen through visits and you know through these story times that, you know, they're the folks that we should be listening to. Mm. Um, so I think that um, it's just, I would I would love to see like you said more ethnic studies, but also just more kind of decent like de centering the focus from um, these mainstream histories that we get told and right. and being able to right. all tell our stories and hear our stories. Yeah, no, and uh, and I think it's 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 even more powerful that you're here, you know, young people and talking about these issues and tackling that discomfort. You're mentioning how you know like. It can be uncomfortable, but I think we need to go there, right? We need to go there and tackle that. And um, it is it is a hard issue. So, you know, like to expect it to be easy to talk about, I think would, you know, would would, would be doing ourselves um, an injustice. We have we have to share that. And I just, you know, like I really appreciate both your insight on this and those um, and the work that you're doing in making sure that we're learning out there. And I think just like Amanda was saying too, it's like, you know, like giving the twos out there and um, and hopefully the little ones that are listening too, like it gives a springboard, something to to start talking about. And so, um, yeah, I really appreciated that. But, um, you know, like I know that the programs that you're doing at Genem, how have, have schools or are there programs that you're doing with particularly with schools, maybe you, I know you have field trips, but also at times, and I, I, I've fallen into this trap at times, teachers, we tend to go on field trips that maybe you've done before. Mm -hmm. And so you tend to go back, you're like, oh, I, I mean, especially if you're staying in the same room, like, oh, I took the last year's group to this field trip and I'm going to do that. So how do you encourage or how do teachers get a hold of, uh, you know, your programs? How do they, and now I think with, kind of a silver lining of the pandemic is that you're probably, you know, like are going to be visiting further places, you know? So how are there any specific programs that you have that, um, that could be helpful for educators and, and parents homeschooling? Absolutely. Right. Um, I totally hear that. We rely a lot, I think on older teachers who've been coming for years, like bringing the newer teachers into the fold and saying, come on this field trip to Janum with us because it is about that repetition and comfort level and 
knowing how to get on the bus and where to park the bus and all of the details. Um, but uh, we do have virtual field trips now um, and they're available across the world. Uh, you can find them on our website at um, janum.org. Um, if you go to virtual visit, you can book one. We'll start booking field trips for the next school year. And this summer around July, we open our bookings. Um, and then we also have, you know, we have an educator e-newsletter that I would encourage any teachers or homeschoolers or people who are interested in the work that we're doing to sign up for, because you'll not only get information on the virtual field trips, but other education stuff that we do. Things like um, professional development, teacher workshops, uh, new exhibits that come to the museum, and things that travel as well, things that are programs like things are Joy that Joy's doing, everything that would be helpful to someone looking for more information. But yeah, it's just about starting to ask the questions, starting to look for the information and not getting too overwhelmed. Yeah, and then they talk about not getting too overwhelmed. And I know that you both have a meeting that you're running to after this. No, we oh, okay. We appreciate <laughs> that time though. Like, I was just like, oh, I need to respect your time. But also I was thinking, you mentioned some activities that were related to art and mm -hmm. that, you know, and as one that teaches, you know, the younger kids, at least for now, I feel like it's um, it's a great way to have that tactile piece, that creative aspect to it, but still address these uh, issues. So, what are some of those things that you do, and and um, and what ages, what age groups are they designed for? Totally. When the pandemic hit, we knew that people, parents needed stuff to get their kids off looking at the computer outside. Uh, low cost, nothing special or fancy. So we got so inspired by our collection. If you go to our website at the link that Joyce put up, uh, education resources that we have, you'll see uh, we have different kind of categories there. Um, in the activities category, we have a whole collection of collection inspired activities. Um, things that draw inspiration, like from the slides that I was showing you, the story of Miss Breed and her letter writing. Mm -hmm. Anyone can write a letter. Anyone can make a pen pal and find that con connection to somebody else. It, even if it's your family member, a friend that lives somewhere else or a friend that lives nearby. Uh, so the letter writing activity is called Write to Me. There's a activity where we encourage kids to make pieces of art from found materials around their house. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like that brooch that we saw, kind of like mm -hmm. the different crafts that were made in camp. That one's called Upcycled Wearables, uh, also in the activities oh. section. And um, and there's a whole bunch more there too that kind of take uh, something that we learned about in camp and turn it into, a, or something that people did with their time in camp or um, a way that they express themselves and using a piece from our collection that's kind of discussed. It's just mm -hmm. a one page PDF. People can print it out um, and get their kid to look away from the computer and um, nothing requires any like fancy materials that you probably would just have around your house. Yeah, and uh, you know, like, uh, which is, is so important, but um, also I look at you both young people and you know, like it's, no, it's really important. I think that that message carries through and that, you know, such important um, information is carried through and taught and shared. But also I was thinking too, like how, how do we encourage more voices like yours in different spaces? How can people show solidarity? How can, I know you touched on that a little bit, but how can, how can people get involved in, in, in this work? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of, and I only laughed because um, <laughs> being young, I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> but um, I think that's been something that, um, well, I can talk from personal experience. I, I think something that has been really helpful is just like learning that my voice and my story are important. Um, and I think that when we are able to kind of feel that, and part of that is seeing yourself reflected in the world and um, getting support from wonderful teachers like you. But like, I think that, um, yeah, it's just been, and the, I, ha I, have, I have something 
to bring to this conversation. Um, mm. But also it's taking time to like listen and learn and learn about people that aren't like me um, has been really important, which I'm, I'm grateful for all the different kinds of stories that you get to tackle that you have this week that is so familiar to me, but I've learned about other, other places from the stories too. Right. And, and that's um, I think also why we need things like ethnic studies in schools because because then we get exposed to stuff and and part yeah. of the um reason for you know incarceration was this fear of the unknown mm. and so mm. when we see a really large-scale thing it's it's that, that i mean it, it was so many political moves and other things but but mm. in the apology that came out in the 90s it was that um the government or sorry the 80s the government finally issued after years of of pushed by activists um mm. redress and reparations mm. and and that was because of you know this fight and 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 in it they said it was because of wartime hysteria racism and a lack of political leadership and mm. um and we, we see that have today three yeah. things we still have today <laughs> so mm. i think that learning this history and like and and talking about it is so important mm. um and then you know this still struggles happening today the fight for redress mm -hmm. is right. happening black americans descendants of slaves are are fighting for redress and reparations now and so mm -hmm. i'm part of involved with a group where um we're working alongside black community members to fight for reparations and and not be like we did it so we know what we're doing <laughs> but mm -hmm. be like mm -hmm we've been in this fight how can we help you how can we support you mm -hmm. and i think that drawing those connections um the letter writing that i mentioned was um us um reaching out to um groups that are involved with immigrant rights in the present day and incarceration mm -hmm. of families and children in the present day and and the story of the children at in the pomona fairground is very different than the story of world war ii it's a different circumstance politically and socially but mm -hmm. it is the Pomona Fairground, like the Santa Anita racetracks, like Tan Fran in the story, was mm -hmm. held, held families during World War II before they were taken to mm -hmm. more permanent concentration camps. So I think that seeking out the ways in which things that feel important to you, um, and they're always going to connect to your story, and they're also going to not, and right. they might be uncomfortable, and leaning into that, um, and also knowing that, like, the world doesn't like to say that young folks are powerful or that like we can we can do something or make a change but it is it is something that i believe really strongly and yeah. and being part of community with folks who are older than myself i get to do community organizing with people that are the age of my parents my grandparents mm -hmm. and having learning from them and them feeling like they're learning from me um mm -hmm. has been extremely affirming and powerful to my story and um yeah so no I'm, I'm just constant state of learning constant state yeah. of learning i don't know if that was answered your question you know i don't no, know if you had anything to add yeah, <laughs> yeah no yeah it absolutely did and uh and, and i think i always say this too in whatever we do whether it's education or like you you, you have to you have to have that desire to constantly learn because i think feeling like you've arrived you've accomplished something is it, you know like it, can put you in a false sense of security because you you know like there's things are changing all the time so we need to be aware of that even just now when you look at it like you mentioned a few things that happened back then and you look at it today in the news so many things that are happening and that have similar causes from from way back then and so how do we keep on our toes and how do we keep learning oh, hope we know you'd hope that you know the, the world would be better but we know it isn't and so yeah like i really appreciate those uh voices and then uh you know just to close like what what advice do you have for those little people out there that are watching or you know that will be watching later on and they're looking to you they're looking at you and thinking oh this can be done and you know like you've, you've given them a sense of being brave and um and also that you've lived the experience and that we're not denying that those things happen and we are acknowledging and how do we then move forward? You know, uh, Nina mentioned, um, Emmy in the book mentions having, being afraid and looking at all these people around her and sensing their fear, right? Sensing their, their fear their, and, and them trying to be strong for others. So how, how, how can we be vulnerable together? How can we grow together? Mm -hmm. And I know Joy already touched on some of that, but Nina, did you want to? 
I think what stands out for me and the fight for redress that happened in the 80s that Joy mentioned, this fight for an apology, it happened because young people decided to start asking questions and decide to start learning and asking difficult questions, asking people to, to be vulnerable requires you to be vulnerable yourself. And, um, and without asking those questions, I don't think an apology ever would have come. So mm. when I think about this history, I'm mostly inspired by um, just the drive that has kept this story alive, that has kept the Japanese American community kind of alive together, right? Mm. Little kids watching this, like you say we're young people, but we're not young, young. But I think like we're <laughs> thinking that we're... <laughs> We went, when you talk about this history so often it ends in the 90s and um, and this community still exists. This community is still fighting and coming together and working together. And, um, and so we need to continue that. We need to continue having people uh, understand not only what we're fighting for, but why we're fighting that to make sure this history would never happen again. Yeah. No. Um appreciate that thank you so much for to both of you and of course you know just bringing your knowledge and and sharing your stories i think i echo absolutely what angela Dutton was saying like thank you for sharing your stories you know your families your experiences and also i think being brave being out there being doing this work is uh, like you're saying it's not easy it's not comfortable um but you're doing it and I just want to really appreciate that and celebrate you both. And Thank and I know you. that there are many, because I see from Joy, I know the many other things that you're doing, the many other people <laughs> that are involved in that. So, you know, um, absolutely. And I hope that everybody that is listening out there, please, you know, like find Jenem, follow those links in the, in the comments. Um, learn about this, learn about, the different cultures in our the different experiences in our communities and that's the only way that we're going to get better and um and also be able to share that share that with our little ones so um thank you so much for joining in on story time today um definitely thought provoking and um it it, it i i am learning i feel you know I, I went through this book many times before reading it live today but still the impact was different and the conversation, mm -hmm. the, 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 the depth that you've brought to it was just absolutely wonderful. And um, I hope out there everybody had a chance to learn something. And um, we'll be back here again tomorrow for more story time. And this time we'll be, thank you to you, Joy, for introducing me to this one too. Thank you very much. We'll be reading this one. And of course, we'll also have a guest, Elaine Hang, right here with us oh, on story time. Yeah, so absolutely <laughs> um, loving this week. And um, yeah, a week of great learning and great reflection. Thanks to you both. And I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So that was Joy Yamaguchi and Nina Nakao. Thank you so much for joining us today and wonderful lessons that they had for us. And I hope that you out there listening benefited from that. I am certain you did. I absolutely did myself. And so I want to wish you a wonderful day out there with your little ones. Yes, let's continue being curious let's continue learning like joy said like nina said let's be in that constant state of, le of learning so that we can be better citizens thank you so much for joining in today on story time i will catch you again tomorrow with another guest another exciting guest and tomorrow we'll be looking at thank you very much so do join me for that one and for today much love from me hugs and kisses to each and every one of you and i wish you a lovely day you and your loved ones enjoy it if you're on summer break like me enjoy it and if not i wish it comes i hope yours comes soon thank you so much much love bye bye Just can't.
can't wait to be here. Read me all of your story, read me all of your story. Where all your dreams come true. Oh. It brings to life your favorite stories with a great big smile. You won't live lonely, won't you start? All the reading, we just can't wait to be here. Brings to life your favorite stories with a great big smile. You won't live lonely, won't you start? All the reading, we just can't wait. Thank you.